We have the pleasure to have Dr. Henry Pierce from Portsmouth Law School. Uh, Henry uh, has already actually contributed to our uh, conferences and is also the, the deputy director of the Computer Law and Security Review. And he will present a paper on Brexit and data protection law, uh, subtitled uh, a missed opportunity for the UK government question mark. So I really look forward to hearing uh, from you, Henry, about your uh, on your view on this. Uh, thank you so much, Henry, for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, right, I will now try and share my screen with, with you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the delay there, but yep, um, I am going to talk about how the, uh, the recent uh, DCMS reform paper arguably represents uh, a missed opportunity for the UK government. So like Karen, I will be um, taking a very forward looking approach to how data protection law might evolve in the post, uh, or how it could evolve anyway in the post Brexit environment, but um, we'll be coming at it from a slightly different perspective. So um, <clears throat> as, as Karen already explained, because of Brexit, the UK no longer bound by the, the doctrine of supremacy and, and all of that good stuff, um, has a newfound legislative freedom, which may uh, allow it to diverge from EU data protection rules to some extent. Um, and the UK government has recently signaled its intention to, to some extent at least, diverge from EU data protection rules. The most obvious example of this comes in the form of the, um, the DCMS uh, reform paper, uh, Data A New Direction, which Karen already spoke about. Um, and as we've kind of covered already, this, this paper contains a number of proposed changes for uh, data protection law in the UK, which supposedly um, are geared towards boosting trade and improving public services. And there's a lot of language that has been used to describe the contents of this paper that, um, well, words like bold, innovative, pro-growth, pro-innovation, these very sort of forward-looking and ambitious sounding words. Obviously, with um, what has come along with this uh, proposed package of reforms are concerns about reductions in data protection standards and how that may negatively affect the uh, UK's adequacy relationship with the EU, but there are other reasons why we may also, I think, the uh, adequacy decision and um, data protection standards notwithstanding, have misgivings and reservations about what is proposed in this um, reform paper. So in, in my view, the reform paper represents a big missed opportunity for the chance to think creatively um, and innovatively about the future of data protection law and how it may evolve, particularly in the post-Brexit uh, uh, environment. And whilst the reform paper and the language used by various politicians and, and other associated people to describe it um, refer to the proposed reforms as bold and innovative, uh, innovation-friendly, growth-friendly, in reality, in my view, to some extent, they are actually disappointingly unambitious. And the model of data protection that is envisaged by the reform paper is in a lot of ways, I think, outdated and may prove to be unsustainable. And the reason for that being is the fact that the model of data protection that is envisaged by the reform paper um, continues to heavily be based around the very, very problematic and difficult concept of personal data itself. So at the moment in the UK, we have the UK GDPR, um, the substantive rules of which apply to the processing of personal data and not to any other data types or information types. And the DCMS reform paper also envisages a, a personal data-based model of data protection um, continuing in, in this vein. So a clear understanding of personal data is at the moment critical for the smooth operation of the law. And this will continue to be the case um, moving forward under, uh, well, assuming the uh, DCMS reforms are enacted. So this is not a great approach in a lot of ways. I think um, 
and what I'm about to sort of the argument I'm about to make is not always universally well received and it has been described by one person I spoke to as heretical almost um, but there are a lot of reasons for believing that the personal database approach to data protection whereby legal rules are triggered as soon as any processing of personal data occurs is very much in danger of becoming unfit for purpose. One of the reasons for this being um, the language used to describe personal data in the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR and the data protection directive before it um, sets out a concept that is in inherently and semantically vague and over time over the, the last several decades at least challenges in determining to what the concept of personal data applies and to what it does not apply has become extremely complicated. Um, and this compl these complications and difficulties have been exacerbated uh, significantly and will continue to be significantly exacerbated by developments in information technology. So the starting point for this argument is just to have a look at the uh, concept of personal data itself, which um, is currently defined in Article 4.1 of the UK GDPR as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person um, and it's also made clear in the recitals of the UK GDPR that um, data protection rules should not apply to the processing of anonymous information or anonymous data. So there are several problematic elements to the personal data definition. Uh, these are the notions of relating to, identified or identifiable and even these words information and data themselves. Um, so what I will do now, and I'll try not to spend too much time on this, but just run through the problems with these, uh, with this terminology and why it is and will continue to cause significant problems for the smooth operation of the law. So first of all, um, as we've said, personal data is information that relates to uh, an identifiable or identified person. This notion of relating to what this actually means has proved to be very complicated and troublesome for uh, UK courts. Um, a variety of tests have been set out, firstly in the infamous Durant case and more recently in the Edom case. Um, and despite um, considerable debate about the meaning of this terminology and the Court of Appeal attempting to clarify the meaning of this word relating to, a couple of years ago, it's still not entirely clear what the correct legal test for this notion of relating to in this context actually is. If we look at CJEU case law, um, there's a slightly, I would say, more consistent and clear message about what this terminology means. Um, notably in the Novak case, it was held that information will relate to a person if it is used or is likely to be used to evaluate them, treat them in a certain way or influence their behaviour or impact on their rights or interests. Um, but whilst the EU approach or well, the CJEU approach to defining or interpreting this notion of relating to is perhaps clearer than the UK approach, it is also very, very expansive. Um, it's an approach that will encompass many types of information that have no obvious relationship to an individual. This um, approach is um, <clears throat> problematic when we view it against the technological phenomenon of, of datification. So increasingly in, in our lives, key, key aspects of our lives are increasingly transformed into digital data. Uh, particularly through supposed smart devices um, uh, and, and smart environments, smart cities uh, and other pervasive computing technolo technology uses. And um, <clears throat> as has been convincingly argued elsewhere, particularly by Nadia Petova, in smart environments, essentially uh, all information that is gathered from um, our presence in certain areas or gathered from devices that we are wearing and how they interact with other devices and uh, sensors in our environments. All this information will be gathered with the intention of adapting those environments, so perhaps uh, adapting heating or escalator speeds or street lighting uh, or, or any uh, huge amount of other purposes. Um, but yeah, any 
and all information that is gathered in this inf these inf environments will be gathered for the purposes of influencing and evaluating and treating the people in those environments in a certain way. And therefore it will, according to the standards set out in the Novak case, relate to these people. Um, the high dimensionality of these data will also uh, mean it will be likely to identify people from these data. And as um, these data will relate, therefore, to identifiable persons, this will make it uh, personal. And the upshot of this is that uh, increasingly the processing of personal data will be literally everywhere, all around us. Um, every aspect of our life will be datafied. It will involve the processing of personal data. And that will mean that the uh, under the personal data based approach to data protection law, um, data protection law will end up applying to essentially, uh, potentially anyway, to every aspect of our everyday interactions and behaviors. And this will turn data protection law itself into this massively uh, resource intensive and uh, compliance intensive exercise of regulating essentially everything. And um, as the maxim goes, a, a law that applies to everything may as well apply to nothing. Um, the notions of identified and identifiable are also hugely um, challenging in this context for data controllers trying to work out what data is personal, what data is not. Um, in order to be, according to the ICO anyway, in, court, uh, in order for an individual to be identifiable, uh, they must be distinguishable from other members of a group, but um, it's not necessarily clear how distinguishable an individual needs to be in order to be considered identifiable, even if they're not clearly identified. Um, from a review of UK and uh, EU case law, it appears that there is a risk-based approach to identifiability, uh, identifiability that is emerging, um, where there seems to be a general agreement that data will only be personal if there is a significant risk of them being used to identify um, a, a natural person. But despite the emergence and recognition of this context based approach, the spectrum based approach to identifiability, it is still not clear precisely at which point they, data become legally personal or, or anonymous, where, where exactly um, this boundary on this spectrum of identifiability um, triggers data sort of becoming personal rather than anonymous. Again, this is another issue that is complicated by developments in, in technology. We've seen uh, that anonymous data are not personal, therefore they fall outside the scope of data protection law. And in order to absolve themselves of their data protection obligations, data controllers frequently use anonymization techniques, which um, that there are many different types, to anonymize personal data and take them outside the scope of data protection rules so they can um, be, be processed without uh, data protection rules applying. However, uh, these techniques are not fail safe. It's been um, shown quite convincingly that um, anonymized data can be de-anonymized. There are a number of different uh, de-anonymization risks that um, are, are out there. I'm not going to talk about those in, in any great detail because I need to get a move on. Um, but the fact that anonymization is, um, freak, is increasingly difficult to achieve, casts doubt again on the basis, uh, on the idea of persisting with a model of data protection that is based around this personal slash anonymous data dichotomy. Anonymization, I believe, um, is still possible, but it is something that um, whether or not anonymization of data has been successful depends hugely uh, on context and will often require uh, specialist expertise to determine whether it's been done properly and it's hugely complex. Um, finally, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip through this part quite quickly. Um, the concepts of information and data are also very poorly understood, I think. They're treated as interchangeable by the courts um, that haven't made any real attempt to disambiguate the meaning of these two things, despite the fact that these concepts are recognized as being very different and intricate in, uh, by, by observers in other fields. Uh, and that can also, will also be, uh, this is a problem that will also be exacerbated by technological difficulties. Um, so the crux of one side of the argument I'm making here is that personal data has become an increasingly unwieldy, nebulous and complex concept. 
Um, this raises all sorts of uh, practical challenges for the smooth operation of any personal data-based approach to data protection law. Um, and instead, we should perhaps have, uh, we should consider other non-personal database approaches to data protection. So one alternative would be to shift to a more purposive information harms based approach to regulating contemporary data handling practices. So under such an approach, data protection rules could be triggered uh, according to the level of risk of harm inherent in specific data processing uh, activities. So for example, we might identify particular activities that are more likely to be harmful than others, such as uh, big data analytics operations, machine learning, uh, profiling, all that kind of um, potentially harmful stuff. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, obviously, if we are to shift to such an approach of uh, information harms and try and regulate these rather than just the blanket processing of personal data per se, we would obviously need to have some understanding of what this idea of harm actually means. And harm is a, a complicated and uh, multifaceted concept in itself, as is the notion of risk. Um, but one way we could do this would be um, expressing the notion of harm as a function of a possible harm severity. Uh, and its probability. So probability of harm multiplied by the severity of harm, in other words. Uh, if we were able to do this, we could then apply data protection rules um, to specific um, data processing activities on a sliding scale, according to the level of harm that is perhaps um, they have the potential to, uh, to cause. So if we um, think about this notion of harm a bit further, there are various pieces of regulatory guidance from all over the world, particularly uh, the USA, the UK and, and France, um, that have articulated taxonomies of different types of harm that might stem potentially from data processing operations. And uh, it's possible to, uh, broadly anyway, uh, according to me, uh, delineate these different types uh, or at least different levels of harm into different categories. Um, there are some very serious harms that might stem from errant processing, uh, data processing activities, and there are others that are much uh, less, less significant, and there are examples of those on the, uh, on the slide here. If then um, we can distinguish um, and allocate a level of harm to individual data processing operations and multiply um, or, or cross-reference, whatever, however you'd like to call it, uh, the probability or the impact of a level of harm against its probability, we can chart the overall level of harm on a harm, a risk to harm matrix like this and work out different uh, sort of levels of harm ranging from minimal uh, through to very low, low, moderate, high, very high and maximum. If we are able to, to do this, um, we can then think about applying data protection rules on a sliding scale basis on a, on, a, on a spectrum, whereby where there is a very minimal risk of harm, um, this uh, act, uh, data processing activities that operate on this basis or could be described in this way could um, carry on with a very light touch application of data protection rules and data protection principles and, and so on. Whereas, um, and as we go up the scale, uh, the rules will increasingly uh, apply on um, with greater stringent stringency all the way up to the point where processing is essentially banned. It's, it's prohibited. So um, this approach uh, would potentially be uh, more flexible and context dependent. It would allow for data protection rules to be applied uh, on um, the basis of contextual peculiarities of, of data, protect, uh, data handling practices rather than on confusing um, and ultimately superficial and possibly unanswerable questions about whether data are personal or not. Uh, and it would move us beyond this all or nothing model for applying data protection rules that we have already uh, at the moment, whereby uh, as I said earlier, the central trigger for the application of all of data protection law is the processing of personal data, whether it's for whatever purpose. Um, there are likely to be a number of issues and challenges with what I uh, this this model that I have kind of uh, sketched and proposed here. 
obviously, adopt think any kind of risk harm based approach in the manner I've set out uh, would require major legislative reform it's, it would be a huge divergence from the way data protection has been dealt with uh, in the UK for well for more or less since the first data protection legislation. Um, there would also be uh, possible incompatibility with the EU GDPR, which is something Karen touched upon earlier as well. Um, although those, uh, with, with more time, I, I could perhaps get into more detail about why the, such concerns may, to some extent, be overstated. Um, and uh, another issue would be that although Although the personal data based model of data protection we have presently is is very complex and to some extent increasingly difficult to operate, there would necessarily be uh, a degree of complexity involved in this um, this model as as well. Um, there's no getting around that and. Um, yeah, I've, I've run out of things to say and I think I may have gone over time so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but thank you very much for for listening.